Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Len Bader. Today, uh, I'm going to have a conversation with somebody you already met. Uh, he's been on uh, the uh, one of the Sunday show, um, and the I had a phenomenal feedback from you, our view, uh, our viewers. His name is Don Prosser. He's not a TI. He's a veteran. He's a, a very unique person uh, because he spent a lot of time in Japan. And I'll let I'll let him talk about it a little bit uh, uh, freely without time constraints because we we were um, uh, last time we talked um, it, we had some time con constraint and we we were really talking about uh, legal. Uh, updates uh, with the um, targeted justice v. Garland lawsuit. So today, it's just a free-form conversation. Uh, we're pre-recording it, uh, so we're probably going to have a lot of pauses, and, uh, um, and let's see what happens. Don, how are you? I'm doing good. Good to see you, Len. Good to see you, Don. Uh, we, I really wanted to do it to do it because I am absolutely fascinated by your um personal journey uh you hinted us a little bit that you were very uh you called yourself disturbed person um and then you were looking for serenity and the place you found it was in japan uh sounds very exotic but this is your life. You probably feel more comfortable in japan than you feel in the u.s that, that that's just my yeah, sometimes yes. Is yes. that is that is that about right? I think so. I would agree. Um, I think because their culture is so um, has depth to it. There's almost nothing that they do that doesn't have some like symbolism to it. Uh, from from sitting down to have a cup of tea, they're not just drinking the tea. Uh, that that can be seen as a form of meditation. Or if you and I were to share a cup of tea that could be seen as a way to uh, heighten the interchange, to, to make it more kind of elevated on a, on a, on a spiritual term. So yeah, you're right. The, the, uh, the culture is just incredibly pervasive and it touches all parts of their lives. That's very interesting. Uh, the, we know the power of the rituals. The, we, they really, um, rituals give us meanings, meaning, but the way um it seems to me it is happening in japan it penetrates all the levels of your everyday life so they literally have rituals for everything oh, how you wake up how you have a cup of tea it, it formalizes it it gives uh, um these simple action some structure and meaning so tell me a little bit more i'm really interested in this power of uh, rituals it's interesting that you mentioned that that was really my pull to to travel to japan um, i had been in the service um, and i think you know seeing seeing things that you do in the military um, especially for a guy like me a very very young kid uh, i grew up out in the woods. Uh, I didn't have a lot of knowledge. I'd never been to college. Um, I believed all people were good. I was very uh, idealistic. Um, and I was uh, very naive, incredibly naive. So you take a young kid, you throw him over seas, and that's a different world immediately. Once I got out of the service, I, I didn't have any tool to make sense of things. Why does this happen? How come I have to blah, blah, blah? You know, you're, you're questioning yourself. Um, you really learn to dislike yourself a lot too. So I, I had tried to turn to different avenues. And I think I was really looking for like a, a Yoda, a kind of a Mr. Miyagi kind of, a, you know, a very, uh, somebody who would have these very interesting statements and they would make me think. And uh, I needed something different. And I had come across... Uh, a Japanese form of spirituality. I, I don't want to call it completely Buddhism because it's a lot more to do with spirituality than religion. Um, 
and this was called uh, Mikyo. And Mikyo literally means um, of esoteric teachings. In other words, you're not going to find it in a book. Uh, well, there's no YouTube back then. There was no internet. Uh, you, you can't research it academically and understand it. And I knew it was all based on ritual. There were certain things that I would take my body through. So um, we, we, in Mikyo, we, we talk about something called Sanmitsu. And Sanmitsu is on three. It means the three secrets. We believe there's a secret of the mind, there's a secret of the body, and there's a secret of the voice. So anytime anything is done, we, we would uh, use a mantra, and a mantra is a symbol of uh, Sanskrit syllables that really, I mean, I've never met another person who speaks Sanskrit or even reads it. So you learn the esoteric meaning behind it, uh, for example, you would, you would tie a mudra, and a mudra is how you position your hands, and this would give me an intention. This is the mudra for single-pointed concentration, and I would concentrate on bettering myself with no taints, and the mantra would be om bojishita bodahada yamni sammaya satoban. Well, that's all Sanskrit, and you'd learn to chant that om sammaya satoban. You'd say it over and over and over, and the, the meaning behind it is all things are pure. I awaken to the purity of all things. So I'm, this is going around in my mind. Everything is pure. I awaken to this. I, even the defilements in life are pure if we see them in the very you know, esoteric sense. So there were these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rituals, which I knew were out there. But here I am in you know, upstate New York, I'm not going to find some Mikyo master walking around Walmart. Um, and I knew I had to travel someplace different. I remember I'd been overseas before. That was a big shock for a 18 year old kid. So I had been overseas, but I'd never been overseas to do anything good. <laughs> you know, and now I was thinking, you know, why don't I go to a different land that I can maybe make myself a better human on this planet? In other words, I had some, I had, to, I had to offset some things. I said, you know, I want to make up and be a better person. And long, long story, I met different people who traveled to Japan and one college professor really, uh, uh, well, he motivated me. I was so um, impressed by his experience. I said, okay, I'll go over there. I had no plan. I had $500 in my pocket which I had sold my car for $500 back then. And a suitcase, one suitcase, one suitcase, uh, a couple t-shirts, uh, neckties. And I was gonna go there and they were gonna love me. I had no idea where I was gonna live. I didn't speak, I couldn't count to three in Japanese. And I didn't even know how to go through customs or anything like that, right? The military did that. When, when they send you overseas, you, you don't walk through TSA. <laughs> You're, you're landing in a military base and off you go. So I'd never even been through customs with a passport. Um, I arrived there. Um, I remember, I honestly thought there was going to be these Japanese walking around with swords and you know kimonos and very traditional. And you, know, you land in Tokyo. Tokyo is like Manhattan on steroids. It's not traditional. And bright lights and taxi cabs and everybody's in western suits so that kind of made me think hmm i don't think tokyo is a place for me uh it was too too busy uh too modern and when i would talk to people they wanted nothing to do with japanese traditions they were all about you know what's cool in america clothing tv shows pepsi cola you name it they wanted to break away from everything that i was looking for so you can imagine if some Japanese guy comes here to America and says, you know, I want to learn about being a cowboy and, you know, rope a horse and do all that. There's not too many people in America who are like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, we're all cowboys. So I decided to move closer to a place called Kyoto. Well, Kyoto is way down in central Japan, but it's, it's like uh, their epicenter of where the tradition still exists. And luckily, Kyoto... There are two cities in Japan that were never bombed. Um, and thank God to two American professors who convinced the United States military 
you cannot bomb these two cities. They have no military significance and it would be like bombing the pyramids. These are historical sites that in hundreds of years, World War II will be meaningless, right? So luckily, Nara and Kyoto were never bombed. And they're the only two cities now that have pretty much uh, roads that go all over the place. The modern cities, uh, Osaka, Tokyo, Nagoya, they were so bombed that when they rebuilt them, it was easy. They could make everything in a grid, straight lines. The U.S. Army engineers came in and rebuilt them very uh, modern. But maybe it's like something in maybe Europe when you have those cobblestone streets or maybe in, in where you're from, you know, you have an old tradition that like you can see a road that used to be a horse trail and now it's a, a small road. So by living closer to Kyoto, I thought, well, okay, now at least I'm in the right neighborhood. Uh, but that's where it got hard. So I'll pause there for a minute because I know I spoke a long time, but that was what got me to the arena. After that, that's when the challenges started. Oh, yeah. So a few things really, really stood out to me. First, I love the way you say Kyoto. Because okay. uh, the Westerners uh, say Kyoto, Ki Kyoto, right. and like the 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 Y is really pronounced, but it's really short, and it and it sounds sounds very authentic Japanese Kyoto. Uh, I absolutely love it. And then uh, in the beginning, you said something that um, I I um realized how much eastern culture and western culture are different fundamentally different so i think in western cu culture everything is black and white good versus evil and then what you said about the purity even the purity of the the sort of bad things it's all it's what it is it's not it's neither good nor evil it's just what it is and you you give um you um acknowledge its purity its existence that is so fundamentally different how how did you handle that that switch is that what you were looking for that that different framework or was it a completely novel thing to you that you have to sort of re relearn. You bring up a really good point. I don't think I was very evolved that I knew I was looking for something as deep as that. I was pretty basic, um, very rural upbringing. Then you go into the military where everything has a way. You don't have your own opinion. You don't need to rethink anything. Uh, they tell you your opinion. So I didn't have a lot of exposure to creative thinking. Um, when I got to Japan, I learned that what is unspoken is usually the deeper message that everyone gets except me. So I would be in these conversations with people and I'm, I was very straight forward talking. And that was, they, they thought that was abrasive to be very straight was almost um, primitive. And they, they had a lot of nuances and analogies and they would allude to something rather than state it. For example, they never say goodbye because they don't want to break the relationship. And the only time you would use goodbye is when you are saying goodbye to someone for like the last time and you know you're never gonna see them. The, the nuance would be, oh, okay, I guess we'll speak again. And that was the assumption, okay, time to leave. All right, dinner's over, get back on the subway. But they would never be so primitive as to say, okay, thanks for the dinner, I'm going now. That was, that was just alien to them. So the, the black and white Don had to adapt to a very, very gray culture, extremely gray. Added to that, it's a foreign language, even more gray, because they have, you know, if they're 20, 30, 40 years old, they have 20, 30, 40 years of 
learning the nuances and the inflection. And I was, I arrived in Japan in 1990 uh, and I had a little paper dictionary. There's no internet, there's no cell phone. Um, and added to that, it's not a Roman language, so you can't look it up. You know, at least in most of the modern languages, if you see a word in Spanish, it, it's the alphabet is the same. So you can look it up and say, okay, agua, water. Now I have to say, oh, what's this little scribbly character? What in the world does this mean? And I actually had to go to this, we didn't have apps back then, but they have a dictionary where you start counting the strokes. And if you're one off, you're screwed. If you make the run in the wrong direction. So I couldn't really speak, read, write, listen to the TV for a long time. So what that did is it gave me a lot of free time. Luckily, near the little crappy apartment that I lived in, this thing, boy, there were rats the size of small dogs. Um, and I, I couldn't afford much. So I lived in this really beat down, uh, and when I say small, it's small. Your living room is your bedroom because you just put down the futon at night, pick it up in the morning kitchen i had one of those little old traditional toilets you have to you know squat down over so it was like going back to like the 1920s um, i had a lot of free time to visit this temple which was right close to my apartment and i so wanted to talk to the priest there he didn't speak any english i didn't speak any japanese so we just kind of nodded a lot we looked at each other and smiled and i had all these like probing questions what's the meaning of life and why do we, you know, why do we kill each other? And why is there conflict? And how do you escape that? And I just, I kind of stuttered in front of him. And I think he knew I was seeking something, but he also had no way to transmit that to me. So we came to an agreement and this was just done by like sign language. I would go there every day in the morning and I would sweep the temple. This was like 4.30 in the morning. I would sweep, scrub. I had a little bandana on my head. Uh, it was hot. There was just tons of work to do. So I would, I was like free labor. In kind of payment for that, because I didn't want to take money. I thought that was bad. He would teach me how to meditate with really no words. I would learn how to sit. He would talk, but then use his hands to talk about um, relax. He would say no thinking. So he would like point up here and say no thinking and give me like one day he would bring in a flower and I knew he was telling me just concentrate on the flower, nothing else. You know, he didn't have to explain it. And it was amazing to learn to master your mind with no language. Almost like language was just another anchor. If he had to explain it to me, I would attach to those words. And that wasn't meditation. Meditation was complete emptiness. Even the lack of uh, words or the lack of language was closer to emptiness than talking a lot about it. So I could go to a lecture, let's say I understood fluent Japanese back then, which I didn't. I could listen and listen and listen. Listening to another person talk about enlightenment doesn't help you at all. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, oh, it must be nice to be you. But, um, you know, it's like listening. If you were to talk to me about medicine, I'm not practicing medicine. I'm not going to be able to go in and do an appendectomy just because you teach me in words how to do it. So morning after morning, um, the months would go by. My Japanese was getting a little better. As a matter of fact, I could like use words, but I couldn't use big, long sentences. And if I did make a sentence, then when he responded, I had no idea what he said because mm -hmm. I only knew what I was saying. So, so it took us a long time mm -hmm. and it was similar to having a Yoda or this Mr. Miyagi in my life because we almost had to mind read. I had to like always guess and, and guess correctly. Even when he told me, you know, what to clean and what to sweep, we had to go to the area, go like this with a broom, you, you broom, sweep kind of thing. And little by little, I, I think I knew him so much more intimately than I've ever known another human being. 
his name is Kuyama. Uh, you call him Kuyama Sensei. So teacher Kuyama. And to know someone but not be able to speak with them, I almost thought, what would it have been like to be in Helen Keller? You're blind, you're deaf, but you can hold someone's hand and you have that tactile feeling or you can like feel the warmth when they're close to you or just like they're 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 almost a cosmic energy. And I could look in his eyes and I know that he knew a Don that no one else on the face of the earth knew because everybody else listens to Don talk. He never did. He just, he accepted me. I couldn't even explain what I had done in the service. I couldn't even tell him. But if I did, I don't think he would have cared. He would have said, okay, yeah, just keep, keep, keep sweeping, <laughs> you know, keep cleaning. Nothing, no negativity could ever affect this man. Um, so that was kind of my first uh, try at learning what this um, serene living was all about. I knew that I didn't want to struggle with conflict and I had immense conflict. I was very dark inside. Um, I had gone from a child who loved everybody who thought all people were good to kind of a dark mass who really didn't like people, really didn't like himself. Um, all these rosy dreams that I had, I wanted to be somebody, those were all gone. I just wanted to uh, seclude all the time. And that's really no way to live a life. It's almost like putting yourself in prison, but giving somebody else the key, right? And I didn't want to keep living that way. That was, that was, a, very, that was a disease within itself. I think I had a, a spiritual disease inside my body. And I noticed that just working with this Master Kuyama, things didn't piss me off as much. And I was very prone to anger, really angry person. Um, and something, something amazing that he did tell me later when we were learning how to converse, he said, you know, all of this mind training, it's not about accumulating anything. As a matter of fact, the more you lose, the happier you'll be. No one had ever told me that before. The more you lose. We're in a society where if you just get this, or you get that, you're going to be a happy camper. Where his idea was empty, always empty, empty everything, even your opinions. If you think you have this solid opinion about something, sometimes doubt it a little. It might make the opinion stronger, which is okay if that's the way you go. But he taught me spend a lot of time with people who don't agree with you a lot of time find out the people that don't agree with you and listen to them he said you are going to learn so much more about yourself and a lot of my opinions i threw away i said oh my god i can't believe i bought this crazy dumb notion for x amount of years and it's all bullshit and it, and it reminds me about how people should consider ti's you know, they think they know everything. They think they have this opinion. They think they understand you. When it's our job to shut up and listen to what you have to say. And say, oh my Lord, I had no idea. It could even be that way. And then to game play, we should imagine what it feels like to be you. We should go into kind of a fantasy land and say, unless I can imagine this, I'm dishonoring Len, right? If I say, oh, no, you're full of shit. This, um, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not giving you the, the honor to feed me part of your life that I can have some empathy for and not sympathy. And I don't want to be sympathetic. That's just, oh, God, I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I'm not him. But empathy is to say to yourself, I am him. It's just we're in a different vibration. He's in his light realm, I'm in my light realm, but I'm absolutely no different than Len at the very, very highest awareness, right? We're, we're both made out of the same light. There's, there's no difference between us. So this would happen. And I, I originally thought, oh, I'll stay in Japan for a year. Ended up staying there for 11 years. Um, it was just a, a very, very different experience. So I'll pause there. I know I spoke there for a long time. No, feel free. Feel free to speak as much as uh, 
as you want. I mean, the, I don't want to interrupt the flow of your of your expression because it, it's a real, it's a beautiful flow, and I, it's like I'm I'm watching this river just just uh, um, just being alive, and 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 your stream of consciousness is just it just so infectious. I, I really loved what you said about ti we actually did play that game we said we mm -hmm. we imagine we did play that game uh on the show and, and it was the best part part of the show by everybody's admission you you really express something so beautifully that recognizing somebody's existence is really the essence of of the person you don't need you don't need to um sometimes the verbal expression is a distraction and just um you, when you when you when you acknowledge someone's existence that validates that person the way he or she is and i think that's what you were trying to to express that's that's not what we do in the in the western society you you are absolutely right we we um we are a culture of possessions we possess things we possess ideas but in a way things and ideas possess us and what you were telling me is that disattaching yourself from all these things will bring you the true true happiness and i don't think people in the western society this is such a foreign idea to them but really there is no other way because this is absolutely true the, the the ego that we create uh it feeds on the things it feeds on the thoughts sometimes people cannot change their opinion just because it would harm their ego and that's the attachment i'm talking about and and one more comment I, when you described your experience i thought this is probably as close as it close as it gets to uh going to a um visiting an alien planet is that right is that, is that yeah is that a good description well, of what you i thought i was on mars uh for probably the first year um just buying groceries i would go into a store and i couldn't read anything so i mean chicken's chicken but you know what if you can't read anything it, it's all trial and error i would buy something and i would immediately take it home and write down whatever character was on this in my little book and then i would try to use it you know if i thought it was cooking oil oh my god it was vinegar okay that's not you know everything was a process of uh you know, okay it's not this it might be that um, kind of like a differential diagnosis, right? We know it's not <laughs> this, but we got a chance over here. So I was doing differential diagnoses on everything. Um, and when you're poor, you really can't eat that much. So I had to say, okay, what can I get for the best bang for my buck? Um, once I really started learning a little bit more about Japanese culture, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't fast. I wasn't a fast learner. It took me um, time. And in Japan, they have a saying, you know, anything learned quickly is forgotten quickly. So it's a gradual process um, that builds depth. And I think it was only when I was there, probably my third, fourth, fifth year, that people took me seriously. Because they would say, oh, yeah, you're an American. You just came over here to uh, find a, a new experience or get something on your resume and then go home after six months or a year. And I was kind of building a repertoire of, of people I was working with and I would find specific, what I thought was specific, they ended up being very karmic. Um, the people I ran into, the, that was not by chance. I knew I wanted to study like a certain ritual in this uh, esoteric Buddhism we call Mikyo. And I would say, well, where the hell can I find anybody who still knows this? Um, you know, you use channels, you talk to people. And in Japan, they're very, uh, the first time you ask it, they never say yes. 
because you didn't work hard enough. It's always that, you know, come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow, knock again. And I would ask and ask, and they'd say, who is this crazy barbarian, you know, who just won't go away? And I remember traveling to the, the mountains outside of uh, Osaka. There's a place called Mount Yoshino, they call it Yoshino-san. And on this mountain, um, it's kind of sexist. They don't allow any women on the whole damn mountain. Um, they figure women aren't allowed to be spiritual. We know that's crazy. Um, and I, I knew there was some masters up there that were practicing this level of intention that was so high that I thought it was almost a cure for mental illness because they could detach from their worldly thinking and almost kind of like meld with nature. Now, young 20 year old kid, 22 year old kid, I don't know anything about the world. That sounds amazing. So I originally saw everything as a, as a, this is cool. Once I started studying with them, they said, you can't, you can't chase this like it's a thing. You can't say, I want to get one more ritual. I want to get, I want to experience this. They said, if anything, the, the ritual is looking for you. You just happen to magnetize at the right time. Unless you get that, there's no inner penetration. It's just you doing the ritual. They said, that's just, that's just acting. Anybody can do that. We can put a monkey up here and teach him how to you know, shake a bell and light a piece of incense and do all that. He said, there has to be an inner penetration. So to really give me a basic understanding, because I'm real dumb American. I didn't know anything. They said, we're going to teach you something called taki gil. I said, cool. What's that? They said, well, you may not like it as much as you think. Because up here on this mountain, remember, this is like November, October, November. It's getting cold on the mountain. It's really chilly. They say, we're going to have you stand underneath a raging waterfall. So, okay, you know, I kind of like, do I stink? You know, do I need a shower? What's going on here? And they said, we're going to teach you that your mind stream has to meld with the waterfall. So in other words, the waterfall needs you to purify it as much as you need the waterfall to purify yourself. So that's like the first stage of, and they talked a lot about this word interpenetration. They call it new ga ga new. You entering God, God entering you. They don't use the word God, but they're talking about kind of a universal energy. They said, we don't pray to things. We don't beseech things. We don't say, oh, I'm in trouble. Please get me out of this one. You know, oh, my taxes are due. Please let me find some money someplace. They said, that's very materialistic. You have a problem. You need this supernatural entity to help you. And then you forget about the supernatural entity. Right when you're having a good life, you forget that. Their thinking was this is a lifetime interpenetration, the and this whatever we want to call it, enlightenment, awareness, um, we call it satori. It's not something to be grasped, it's something to taste, and then come back and taste again, and then come back and taste again. Because to possess it. In other words, anybody who says they're enlightened, there's no way they can be. It's the guy who says he's not enlightened, who doesn't know what the heck he's doing, that's the guy to chase down. Well, that's the guy to go get, the one that can't use words, right? So I was, I was training with these guys under these waterfalls, and it's brutal cold. I mean, and all they give you is a little tiny loincloth, you know, looks like you're in the like 1600s. So I'm shivering, shivering, and they knew I had to, I had to work through the body first. They say, yeah, everybody, everybody shudders, everybody has a hard time at first. But once you allow the water to wash over you, not to assault you, then the cold water is actually, it's cold to keep you aware. And it hits the crown of your head at one spot, boom, boom, over and over and over. Almost like it's opening a chakra, uh, if we, you know, a, a mind type of thing. And you're chanting this, there's a special, we're using a special mudra, we're chanting this, hundreds and hundreds of times. And there's candle lights around you. So the ambiance is amazing. But after a while, you're not sure if you're chanting the mantra or the mantra is chanting you. 
you're not sure if you're the human or you're the water coming down. You're not sure if you're the if you're breathing the night air or the night air is being sucked into a human. There was a very interesting way that there was no discursion. There was no you, me. There was no it, them. Uh, everything made sense, but it didn't have to make sense. It just, it was. And that was kind of the serenity that um, was very romantic to me, very mysterious. And I knew to kind of clear my own conscience, I, I didn't need to do something. I need to do nothing. And by that, I mean, it doesn't mean there's no effort required, but I had to do things that don't have a, um, like a Western payoff. If you study hard, you'll get into college. If you work hard, you'll get, a, there's always a, there's always a prize for us, it seems. But by living there, the prize was you're releasing things instead of gathering them. So the emptier my bag was, the richer I felt. And that was so ironic for a little kid who grew up, you know, out in the woods who had no experience in the world. Most of us would say, I want to get out there and get something. I want to have a new experience, a, a new girlfriend, uh, a new job, uh, new, 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 new. Where my mission was really to say, shut up, Don. Shut up, Don. Shut up, Don. And I think I just mimicked that master. I just said, well, he didn't need to talk. When, when they're teaching me, just be quiet. I don't have to ask questions. I don't have to give my opinion. Because I think if I did, I would, uh, I would dishonor what they were teaching. Like these teachings have been around for thousands of years. They don't need Don Prosser to give an opinion to make them better. I need to honor the teaching and say, whoa, this works. It doesn't need me to doubt it, to test it out. I have to, I have to become the teaching as much as the teaching is being given to me. So a very, 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 very different way of, um, I don't wanna say learning, but I think that's the only word I can say, is it, it, developing or maybe maturing, which, and I'm not saying this would work for everybody. Some people might get there and say, oh my God, that, that just is not for me. In my own case, it seemed to work for how messed up I was. And maybe that's the reason I had to be really, really messed up and be, I was everything that was the opposite of spirituality, whatever it was. I was drinking too much. Um, everything about me was so unspiritual that when they got a hold of me, they must have said, oh my God, this guy is so messed up. What are we gonna do with him? Well, screw it. We're gonna have to teach him the real effective stuff because he is messed up. And I mean, it is, at the beginning, I think I was like a toy to them. Okay, here's this crazy white barbarian. We don't know what he's doing here, but we'll just try out some of this stuff on. So an amazing experience, absolutely amazing. The, what you describe is really, it's, it, it truly is amazing. What, what um, came to my mind as you were experiencing, the, as, uh, as you were describing your waterfall ritual, and the way you described it, um, it reminded me of classical Buddhist teachings of uh, of dissolving the ego. That the you you supposedly that supposedly exists lives in your head. That that the little little uh, human being with its own sort of uh, uh, ideas, um, it disappears. It goes away. And you merge with the experience. You are becoming that experience. So what you you describe in the the waterfall, the cold water. Um, when you say you you became the waterfall, you became that experience, and that is it is so hard to achieve because we are constantly distracted by our own thoughts, by our own desires, and and the emptiness that you describe is the prize the emptiness the reach the the, the emptier you get the uh, stronger you, you get the the happier you get because you are just exp 
experience. You are the experience. Whatever's happening to you is the experience. It could be a waterfall. It could be a conversation with land. It could be walking the dogs. That's what's happening. That's the experience. And people, I don't think people appreciate every moment of experience. It is so precious. Unfortunately, for some of us, this is this is a dream, a, an uninterrupted experience. Because uh, as you know, TIs are constantly bombarded, constantly interrupted. We we cannot relax. There's something happening in our brain intentionally. This is a it it, it is beyond invasion. It is because your brain, your mind is the tool you use to achieve that emptiness. And you can't empty it because it is intentionally put in your head. The voices, the V2K, the directed energy vibration sensations. I was thinking about, about that, that when you were describing uh, uh, a waterfall um, experience, I was thinking, okay, so when a directed energy attack happens to me and I start vibrating and and and, and completely um just just um powering through it really um can I become that experience can I kind of embrace it and I think it's possible but I I have not been able to dissociate dissociate completely myself from this this brutal force of energy that's been put into me and made me just suffer. I I I as much as I want to disassociate myself from the suffering, kind of embrace it. It is just too painful, and I don't think. I think the part of your brain, of your mind, or then then anatomically, there the parts of your brain that anatomically that, that we know that this, this is the function um, that you can activate that part of the brain and you will tolerate pain. And so that's what uh, that's what you were doing. I think you were uh, uh, intentionally activating that that part of uh, of your brain, uh, tolerating the pain, and then then it becomes just an another just another experience so so you know who is to tell you know a, a um a pain from a from a good workout a muscle soreness uh could be indistinguishable from you know pain from from an from an injury but we enjoy one and but we do not enjoy another so right. uh I was trying to apply that principle to these attacks and I just couldn't. I just couldn't because it was totally paralyzing me. It, it was not allowing me to utilize my mental resources to to, to get to that point. Um, and I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, that's really what captivated me when we first started speaking. I thought, if there's ever any practical, it's probably not the right word, practical usage, and again, I'm going to the other extreme because I think for me, spirituality is about no use, no practical, everything is the opposite of, but what if we could implement that to say, uh, create a incredibly mysterious and effective defense absolute defense against this and it made me think about when we learn meditation at the beginning we learn to attach before we learn to detach right we have to start out simple we learn to attach to something that's our breath that's the first lesson we all go through is counting the breaths it, it allows you to attach to the breath so that hopefully this thing called monkey mind and monkey mind is where you random oh shit did i did i do the dishes oh did i leave the lights on you know those crazy just millions of thoughts that come in we call that monkey mind because it's like a monkey jumping from branch to branch they have no connection one minute you can be thinking about sex the next minute you can be thinking about your taxes there's no correlation so to tame that monkey mind 
we start counting breaths. We try to get to 10. And a lot of times you don't even get to three. What do you do? You start back at one. There, there's no way to fail. The only way to fail is if you die on the, the, you know, the mat. You're not breathing anymore. So if you're counting these breaths and then this monkey mind jumps in, you recognize it, label it. Oh, that's Don's monkey mind. Go right back to one. So we can't get detachment though without first mastering attachment. So when we do this, what if there was a way to create a type of psychic defense that yes, my mind, that my monkey mind is susceptible to your energy weapons, right? Because it, you need me to be a chaotic, confused, scared, defenseless orb for this directed energy to assault me, right? To uh, oppress me, right? What if I'm not that orb? What if I'm a different orb that this energy, I, I actually welcome it, I marry it, and I allow it to just transmute right through me. Like I so embrace it that this energy meets me and says, wow, this is a friend. This, this, this is not someone we're supposed to confuse and give pain and have headaches. Wow, this, it's almost like we're, it's a, one drop of water going into the ocean. Where's that drop of water? Where's the ocean? The ocean is just a, a, a sea of made up raindrops. But then one raindrop goes into the ocean. How do you tell the difference between the two, right? And if that defense were, were possible, I think it would have to start with an emptiness of self, right? Because there, there would be no me to attack. Now, is this something that could be you know, simply done overnight? I'm not so sure. But my teachers have always told me um, that we get a Buddhist name when we become a uh, priest. Mine was Gion. Gion means compassionate warmth. You, um, you have two characters in your name, and G means compassion, On means warmth. Your teacher gives you one character of his name. So, for example, my teacher was G Kai, that means ocean of compassion. So, G is compassion, Kai is ocean they get to choose, they can give you one character out of their name to make your name. That's why it's there. It's like an unbroken succession. Every single master says, well, I got this character, I got that character, whatever. So my teachers would tell me, Gion, you complicate things all the time. You're always trying to make them so much more complicated and abstruse. And they're so, so simple. Don't add you to the mix just be the mix every time you're adding in your own idea your own impression all this stuff so that's that's for when you're 120 and living on a mountain and, you know and levitating don't do that now just be quiet meld whatever you think that's okay think that later but every time you're thinking about it you're not doing it you're not experiencing it so if that could be created think about what a almost a gift to mankind that could be. We have another way of, because the, the main goal of life is to alleviate suffering, right? That's, I think we're all trying to do that in one form. If we're an accountant, if we're a doctor, if we're a plumber, there's some suffering, whether that's a broken pipe, a broken heart, uh, a broken bank book, whatever that is, we're trying to alleviate suffering. And the Buddha says this, that all life is suffering. Why is it suffering? because we attach to pleasure. And for us, this unenlightened being, we think that suffering is the opposite of pleasure. The trick is suffering is a form of pleasure. It's experiencing the human condition. Now, I'm not saying we should suffer and love it, you know, go do harm to someone. He said, no, the suffering is angst. It's angst about the current situation that you're in. Um, in psychology, cognitive dissonance, right? I don't like this. I want something else. But if we experience that suffering at the highest, highest sense, we would say to ourselves, I'm fortunate to be in this human body to have the ability to suffer through this, be aware that I'm suffering, but also be aware there is no me to suffer. And I think that's a very evolved type of thinking. 
certainly there's a Don Prosser skin. If you light me on fire, it's going to hurt. But in the end, am I just the skin? Am I just this mind? And is the mind that I have today the same mind I had when I was 12? Well, I don't think so. And it's not that the mind has grown. The mind has danced. It, it's, it's taken these experiences and created a, uh, I guess, well, it's created an experience we call life. And we think all these points are connected. We think who I was at one is the same person as I am. And you know, as, as a physician, not our whole body, it's, it's a completely different body. There's probably not that many cells in me right now that I still had when I was born, right? The majority. And as you know, there's more emptiness in my body than there is mass. So what does that really say about us? We are spiritual beings playing on a physical realm. We're just, we're, we're just playing, we're experimenting. And I think that's what happens when these mind to mind things happen. Um, we say, God, I know exactly what Len's thinking. We're crossing over there for just a split second. We're crossing over that division that we think, oh, he's separate from me. And I think that's my emptiness entering you and your emptiness entering me, right? And, it's, and who, who can tell if that's happening? Um, that's why I think when, when we meet people, you always see the Buddhists do this. It's called gasho. It just means I honor you. And I also see the, the me in you. If I see me in you, I can't hurt you. I can't oppress you. I can't assault you. I can't injure you because I'm injuring myself. And we find that with parents. You know, parents are not going to go injure their children because that's their offspring. But I think the Buddha talked about this where he said, all beings are my children. And I'm not just talking about humans. I'm talking about the leaf, the air, the waterfall, the lightning. If it's not, how can it be separate from me only in my mind? Because my mind says, am why, my. And as soon as we put possession, I think my father, my life, we immediately put a block between you and me. This is my stuff. That's your stuff. And that, I think that's what breeds conflict. And I finally found out what happened in the military was exactly that. There was us and them. And they must be bad. But if I put my shoes, or if I put myself in these guys' shoes, he was looking the other way saying, oh, that, that darn Don Prosser, I got to kill him. He, he's a bad guy. Me thinking, whoa, 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 how can I be the bad guy? I'm righteous. I'm the good guy. So that perspective shifted. And if all nations had that perspective, there is no way there can be conflict. And there's no way there can be this disparity between uber rich and uber poor. Because by very nature, we would have to help these people because they are us. We couldn't bear to see them suffer because it would be like seeing your own child starve. You would do something. And I, and I wonder if I was looking for serenity, peace, or just emptiness. And maybe those all three are all the same thing. Maybe, maybe they're all just different flavors of the same, the same puff of air. That's that's a very interesting theory. You know, the we 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 started with emptiness and we we ended on the topic of emptiness. You actually articulated such a message of hope that something can be done, something spiritual can be done to to our situation. And and I have a comment about that because when you stand under the waterfall or when you burn your skin, this is a sensory input. Mm -hmm. But what happens when the intervention happens actually inside your brain? It's not sensory, it's direct intervention. And it's direct intervention with those, those parts of the brain they, that can make that disattachment possible. So it it robs you from that very weapon that you would develop to fight something like this. So that's while I, I am listening to your message of hope and I'm also 
pragmatic about what's happening because I I have a firsthand understanding of what's ha what's happening and, and I and I also educated myself about what these weapons do to humans brain to human brain and I I have I have a suggestion this is a good good uh, a point in our conversation where maybe we should pause and call it part one and like that um and release it and and see what people think about it I am absolutely, I'm enjoying these conversations. I'm learning so much from you, Don. I mean, we really recognize each other. I, I, I you, you're my favorite person, Don. This is, wow. this is, I'm not, I'm not just saying it without meaning it, but without meaning it. You gave me so much hope, understanding, and 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 the exchange is just so precious. Um, so I would like to continue this conversation, but I'm also I, looking for feedback from our viewers. Don, uh, please uh, 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 say goodbye to our uh, list of viewers. I shall, and I, I want the people listening to know, um, I do a, a, a ritual twice a day, once earlier in the morning, like five, and then once in, before I go to bed, like eight or nine or 10 o'clock at night, and there's a part of my ritual where I dedicate it to you. I sit down and I envision you. Um, we do a couple of these empowerment things. And I really say to myself, what can it be like? And I start going through things. Is he experiencing this? Does that happen to him? And every time a tear comes down, I know that's a tear of purifying whatever's happening in, in whatever way that is. And I can only imagine it. And that brings me to tears. I cannot imagine what truly experiencing it is. Tears probably wouldn't do enough. You're going to scream, bang, hit, immense suffering. And if more people knew that this, this suffering is probably on a scale that would make, you know, the worst suffering look like a walk in the park. Um, it is a travesty. It's, um, it's inhumane. That's the only word I can say. It's inhumane. Things that humans should not do to other humans, not even to other animals, right? So they've gone off the deep end. So I'm going to continue. I call it a prayer, but I like the word empowerment more because it, it's prayer with a little caffeine, like a little kick. It, it's got something to do. So I, I totally look forward to our next conversation. You, my friend, end up teaching me every time we meet. So I am your biggest fan in the world. Likewise. Likewise, Don. All right. See you. See you everybody next time. Look for part two with Len and Don. Have a good have a good day. All right.